And good morning, welcome. So glad you're here. My name's Ross. If you don't know me, welcome to Life Point Crossing. Welcome to another installment of Stand Alone. We've been talking about things that, how we all really love that ideal of the modern cowboy who's going to do their own thing regardless of what everybody else might do, regardless of whatever's popular and how that really turns out to be very popular, except in reality then it's never popular because that's basically the whole premise. And so sometimes it's not popular or it's difficult because you're fighting against the way of the world or what's normal in our society. Sometimes it's just difficult because it's difficult. And today is going to be one of those where this is something that in theory, probably everybody or most everybody would say, oh yeah, that's great. That's a good idea. We should all do that. But then when it comes to really reality, you're like, oh, yeah, that probably would be right, but I'm just not going to. Or maybe even, I'm not sure that's really always a good idea in the first place. And it's something as simple and as easy and as uncontroversial as just loving people, which we're all for. But sometimes they're hard to love. And so in a moment here, I'm going to show you a meme, and I just want to give you a heads up because this could otherwise be awkward. I'm going to tell you why I don't like it. So I'm just telling you that beforehand so I don't show it, and then you're all like, oh, hey, that's great, and then I say, and then because then that, that's weird. So here, here it is. You've probably seen this or something similar to this, maybe, depending on how much of your life you spend on Facebook, is someone pictured obviously as Jesus says, love everyone no matter what. <laughs> and then somebody says, well, but what if they have tattoos? There's a number of different variations of this. Sometimes, what if they're gay? What if they have a different skin color? I haven't seen, what if they're mass murderers? But that one would actually be a little bit more interesting. Um, and then, of course, Jesus responds with, yes, but he's not even answering the question about what if they have tattoos. He's answering a completely different question even if they ask stupid questions. And what I think people like about this is it pictures Jesus kind of calling somebody out on asking a question that we all know really shouldn't have to be asked. But I don't like this, and I'll tell you there are a couple reasons. One of them is I don't know why people think it's awesome to make Jesus kind of a jerk about being loving to people. It seems honestly kind of self-contradictory, doesn't it? And the, the, for sure there are places in Scripture where Jesus speaks very harshly, but it's always either one of two things. It's always either to break through somebody's self-righteousness or when somebody is intentionally trying to trick him or trap him. Never does somebody come to Jesus honestly with a, a question or a need or even theoretically in this case maybe to, to help uh, clarify something that he said and then Jesus is rude. Come on. Number two, I've already a little bit alluded to, we all know this isn't a question that shouldn't really even have to be asked. In fact, I'll go a step further and I'll say I'm not sure this is a question that even is asked. In 48 years of growing up in the church where my dad was a pastor and then just living life in the world and being on a church staff and being a pastor, never have I ever had anybody ask this question or even insinuate that perhaps Jesus would have said, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean people with tattoos. Nobody says that. Nobody believes that. Certainly there are people who you can find that believe tattoos are sinful. That's a real position that some people hold. But nobody would then say that, well, yeah, if somebody has some sort of sin, then probably Jesus would say we shouldn't love them. That doesn't even exist. That's In debate, that's what we call a straw man, where you construct an argument that's either completely fictitious or even just mischaracterized or grossly exaggerated so that then you can very cleverly push it down and show how foolish they are, but you're arguing with a ghost. It's not even a real person or a real position. Nobody believes that. And so we have uh, Jesus making a very non-Jesus answer to a question that isn't even being asked, so we can say, oh, haha, I understand Jesus and being loving so much better than those other idiots. I don't think that's really uh, the, uh, the, and I, like, I hope I'm not doing that to whoever made the meme or likes or shares the meme or, or whatever. I hope it's not that. Um, that's just why I, I don't like the meme. But here's what's popular is I love and respect everybody. Of course I do. 
And how about every one of us, I hope and expect that every one of us would say that or want to say that, even outside of the church, if you did a man on the street thing, that maybe there would be some dissenters, but most people would say, of course, yes, I love, I love everybody. Everybody's worthy of respect. But then if you look around in the world, and not at all to dismiss, like there is so much good. There is so much love. There are so many people who are so wonderful to each other and support each other. I'm not trying to minimize or gloss over that at all. It's just not what this message is about. Because you look around in the world and you do sometimes see quite a bit of not love. Right? Isn't that true? Because uh, I'll bet for most of us even, uh, probably every one of us, if you're really honest with yourself, okay, and I can't see into your heart, but God can, so you may as well be honest with yourself and God. There's nothing to lose with that. There is probably somebody or somebodies or some group or something that you just really don't love. And if you're really honest with yourself, you don't. And I'll, I'll acknowledge this just right up front. I think this is just true, okay? There are some people that are harder to love than others. Maybe it's them. Maybe it's just the, the two of you just aren't able to click or ever get on the same page, and it always just seems difficult. But this is just like really, some people are harder to love than others. And also, before we go any further, I think this is very helpful. I think we should probably do this a lot more, both in the church and in society. But let's, let's say exactly what we do and don't mean by love, because, boy, this never happens, but this is so helpful and so clarifying. So this is just my personal attempt to kind of distill and clarify what I think Jesus and the New Testament authors mean when they talk about love is to wish the best for, okay, number one, genuinely, and to go even another step and check out another box, to be willing to give yourself for somebody else's best, right? So that doesn't mean that you have to enjoy every aspect of somebody and their personality, it doesn't mean that you have to approve of and love everything they do or every choice they make. Uh, if, if you believe that tattoos are sinful, certainly I do not believe that what Leviticus refers to is similar to our modern 2024 North American conception of a tattoo. But if you do, you can believe that it's, somebody should not get a tattoo and you're, you're wishing for their best, even if, again, I don't necessarily agree with that line of thinking, but... Um, that doesn't mean you don't love somebody if you believe that they're doing something that isn't going to be good for them, then you, certainly you can do or say that in an unloving way, but that doesn't mean that you're not being loving. Also, I don't know exactly how this happened, but let's just say this. By love, we do not mean engage sexually. Somehow our society has conflated these two to where love means, like this is identical to engage sexually, which would mean that last week's message on sexual exclusivity and restraint, the church was saying, don't love anybody except your spouse. Like, don't love your parents. No, and all of a sudden things get, they get weirder than that if you keep going, which I'm not going to. So I don't know however that happened. But we all know, we all understand that love does not mean to engage sexually. Let me also say that, or let me say, okay, this, what I hope this does is this hopefully takes away also the cheap kind of, well, yay, I love everybody, yay, like just, but you're not doing anything to back it up, right? The, the, the very cheap kind of meaningless warm fuzzies to everybody. Maybe it's even well-intentioned. It's definitely better than I hate everybody, but this is going to require a little bit more. And yes, to be honest, this does mean that with human limitations, you are not going to be able to love literally all of the 8 billion people on the planet in a meaningful way. That's just a, a part of what this is. So if someone comes to you and you really work and give of yourself to love your spouse and your children and your neighbors and your church family and the people of Sudan through giving to a humanitarian project. And they say, well, you don't love the people of South Sudan. It's a completely different country, but you don't even know that because you didn't care enough to even look that up. You do not have to accept that guilt bomb. But what we do want to do is really legitimately be loving. And so all that out of the way, here's what's common is, oh, I love everybody. And here's what's also common is, you know who I can't stand. Sometimes it's an individual, it's Phil from HR. Every time I see him, I want to punch him in his punchable face. 
just don't like, just can't stand that guy. Maybe it's a group of people. You know what? It's New Yorkers who they think they're better than you just because they live in New York. Maybe it's a, a class of people. Some people maybe don't, they don't really don't like rich people because they think they're greedy or exploitative. Some people maybe don't like poor people because they think that they make poor decisions or don't work hard. Maybe it's Broncos fans. Maybe it's whoever doesn't move over to let you merge on I-70. But... There's somebody or somebody's, I would imagine, for all of us, I, I left out the really hot-button ones, then you'll be just thinking about and mad about the whole message rather than listening to what Scripture has to say to us. But there are a lot of places to go in Scripture for something like this. For today, what I have found most appropriate is from what we call Philippians chapter 2, and the context here is explicitly how we think about and treat one another, and here's part of what it says. It says, don't be selfish, okay? Selfish always kind of has a negative connotation, at least when you use that word. So don't be selfish, and don't try to impress others, which, all right, that kind of smacks of ego and, and you know, kind of show off. So, all right, we're not supposed to do that. It's fair enough. What are we supposed to do? It says, be humble. Okay. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Some of the translations say, like, as more significant than yourself. And that be humble comes up a lot, doesn't it? And so this is part of what that means, is consider others before yourself. And it says, don't look out only for your, at your own interests, but, be, uh, but take an interest in others too. And so now this is really kind of where the rubber's meeting the road a little bit. And for sure, I don't think this means to believe that you are worth less than another human being or that Jesus died for somebody else more than you, but it sure does, as clearly as can be, it surely is calling us to give priority to other people over ourselves, which is the opposite of selfishness, and so this really all works together, I think, really very cleanly. And a lot of the time, this, this can be maybe somewhat difficult, but isn't too difficult, with the people who you like. With your, your friends and your family, the people who treat you well, then probably most of us don't have too much difficulty with this. Of course, yeah, I look out for my friends and my the person who has my back, absolutely I have their back. And you know what? That's good. I support that. That's really noble and wonderful. It's just also kind of normal. And this series isn't about doing what's normal. This series is about doing what's right and best, even when it's not normal. And so what about the people who are really, really annoying? What about the, the people who are loud but ignorant? What about the people who are inconsiderate and maybe even just flat out rude or poorly intentioned? Surely this isn't going to tell me that I am supposed to consider I was better than myself or give priority to those people. And how could anybody possibly justify this is suggesting such a thing? Well, here's the next sentence. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And then in the verses that follow, which we won't go through on the screen, but it's a very well-known passage, very well-known couple of verses that describe both the attitude that Jesus had and then also, in fact, the actions that came from that attitude, which included things like, although he was himself the very God through and by whom all of the world and humanity was created, he gave that up. It says he emptied himself of his divine privileges, and he took the position of a human being, right, the, the kind of human being that he himself created, and then as a human being was obedient to God the Father with whom he was equal to the point of allowing himself to be executed by the very humanity he created for their good. And so what's popular is to say, be like Jesus. Again, probably even outside of the church, people who maybe don't believe that Jesus was necessarily God come and living a sinless life and dying and resurrecting so that we could be forgiven and adopted into children, as children of God in his family forever. Even people who maybe don't believe that, probably a lot of them would say, oh yeah, Jesus is a great person to emulate. I, we, people should be more like him. I'd like to be a lot like him. And there's going to be some you know, discrepancy perhaps between the, the Jesus of the scripture who says sometimes very difficult things and the Jesus of pop culture who believes whatever whoever happens to be speaking is saying, but that's, that's going to be fairly popular to say to be like Jesus. Well, if we actually try to do this, 
even in the church. Listen, I hope that the series title will be a little bit of, of exaggeration, right? Oh, you, you won't be the only one standing alone. But the crowd is going to get a lot smaller, right? If we really take this seriously, to do as we're called to do and to, to think and act as Jesus did by giving himself up for others, for human beings who are objectively worse and worth less than he was as very God. But here it is, who, follower of Jesus, whoever is with you or not with you or, or whatever, this is the archetype of how we are to treat people, including maybe even especially the people who are hard to love the people who it costs us something to love, the people who in a transactional economy, you will come out behind if you choose to love, is to follow the attitude and the example of the one we follow, and in fact, exactly for the reason that we follow him, is because he chose to love us when we were hard to love, when it cost him something that honestly we're not even really able to fully comprehend. And, and we were all willing to come out ahead when following Jesus meant that we got better than we deserved. But now it's our time to turn around and offer that to somebody else even when it's maybe not what they deserve. So, okay. Okay. The be like Jesus, who we have all benefited from, is a, a pretty strong play. So what, what, what do we do? What, do you, what what do you want me to do? Well, just some suggestions. We'll start where we start quite a bit, because I think it's a good place to start, is you can start by praying for them. That means really praying honestly and genuinely for their good, not praying, God, show them how terrible they are so that they can turn. But right, like honestly and genuinely for their good. Make it a repeated, consistent practice to pray for the good of whomever it is, whatever person, individual, group, class, however it is, whatever it is for you, that you have trouble loving. And here's something that's very, very likely to happen, is God may change them. God will almost certainly change you. Wouldn't it be amazing if the next time you hear a message like this, hear or preach a message like this, you are just fresh out of people that were hard to love, genuinely are wishing the best and, and willing to give of yourself to the best for anybody truly who you can think of. And as you do this and God changes your heart and gives you more of his heart, you are growing in Christ-likeness, right? Isn't this so good? And if there isn't anybody specifically that you find hard to love, you can still get in on this. You just Whoever it is, you still don't like to be cut off in traffic, right? Or, honestly, on the drive-in this morning, there was a car that I became, I'm going to say the car because that's depersonalized, but we all really know what it means, that I was so angry with. And I did not want to pray for him, but I'm, I know I'm driving here to say this to all of you. I did not want to pray for them and for their good. Probably any other week I wouldn't have, just to tell you the truth. But I will also tell you the truth that even in, the, right, even like immediately, okay, it changed my heart a little bit, right? I, was, I immediately became less frustrated with them and they were a little bit less difficult to love. So even if it's the, the car that, that cuts you off in traffic or you see someone who did something terrible on TV, make it your habit to immediately and consistently pray for them and their good. Will God change them? Maybe. God change you? Oh, I bet he does. Here's a number two, which is something that's so simple and so common and so familiar. You've all heard this in a variety of contexts, even not even necessarily in church or with Bible or Jesus, but is so difficult to apply in real life so often. Is whoever it is, whatever it is that they do or are that you don't like, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know why they are the way they are. You know there's a reason. Maybe even you think you know the reason. Maybe you even do. And even if you do, there's a big difference between understanding and excusing. We don't necessarily excuse inappropriate behavior, but understanding does help with understanding. And so if you can understand 
why somebody is how they are or why they do what they do, or even if you don't, which most of the, you almost never probably really fully know, to just think yourself through and acknowledge the reality that there's a reason, and I just don't know what it is. In some ways, I feel like we've made, actually as a society, a lot of progress in this over the last several decades, particularly in regards to things like the effects of past trauma or mental health situations. It used to be even just a, a few decades ago when I was young, if someone had problems, you'd be like, man, I don't know, they just got problems. And it was really not at all in an empathetic sense, it was really much more in a dismissive, maybe even like kind of dehumanizing sense. In some ways, it's never, it's never really evenly applied, but in some ways, I think we've made a lot of progress on that. Oh, they have Tourette's. Okay, that's why they are that, that, the, the way they are, and now we have much more understanding for them, right? When I was a kid in the 80s, even like the bad kid at school, he was just the bad kid at school. And we even probably knew on some level that he had probably a really hard home life or was born into some situations that were really difficult and not at all his fault, but... I mean, it was just still the bad kid, didn't really care. And, and now I feel like there's a lot more understanding for things like that. And again, this is never really evenly applied across different things, but so much, it is so much easier to have some understanding and to people be so much easier to love when we think and just recognize and acknowledge the reality that, well, there's, okay, there's some reason. That guy, he was just completely rude to me for no reason at all. Well, maybe it honestly was no reason that had to do with you. Maybe you really were innocent or whatever as far as that goes, but his wife just told him she wanted a divorce. Well, I didn't know that. Well, of course you didn't know that. Let's just acknowledge that we don't know that. And immediately, people become a little bit easier to love. There's a reason why they are the way they are. If you know, then you know. If you don't, but you can just think yourself through the fact that you don't know. It'd be a lot easier to love. Number three, going halfway back toward prayer, try this. Ask yourself, okay, well, what is God teaching me or growing in me or preparing me for through this difficult situation or person? Without going back through a whole bunch of scripture that I felt like we've been in quite a bit recently, you all know that God works in you and grows you and teaches you through the difficult situations and circumstances far more than the easy times when everything goes right. Why should it be any different with people? So for whoever it is that maybe feels like it's making your day a little harder than it needs to be, here's what you can do is you can just be annoyed and frustrated by that. Or you may still be annoyed and frustrated by that, but then think about, okay, well, right, God, what, what can you teach me through this? How can I grow through this experience? You're probably going to be annoyed. You can just be annoyed, or you can have it, one of my favorite words in the English language, redeemed, and take something from it of growth and of value and benefit. Which of those sounds better to you? And then finally, maybe the most difficult, but you know it's true, so difficult. Remember that you are somebody else's difficult person. <laughs> if you really want the super airtight church answer for this, it's kind of the same as a lot of things just go right back to Jesus and Philippians where we started, right? Where you were the person who Jesus had to die for although he was himself very God and we are humanity. So if you have accepted Jesus, you have accepted this about yourself relative to God. And this is interesting. There aren't a lot of things like this, but at least in some ways, this, I think, has the, the opportunity to be even worse between yourself and another human being because whatever you have going on with God is not based on some misunderstanding, right? Sometimes another person's difficult or you're their difficult person because of some misunderstanding. There's no misunderstanding with God. Maybe sometimes with you and another person, there's been like kind of a little back and forth and things kind of escalate and you both have sort of half of the, the culpability. Well, that's not the case with God, but it sure, it sure can be the case with other people. So we've all accepted this with ourselves and with God if we're here as followers of Jesus this may be even worse or have more opportunity to be even more whatever the word would be with another human being. So 
for however many people there are that you find sometimes difficult to love, the law of math suggests that there might be a very similar number of people for whom you are one of their people. How would you like them to think of you? What would you think if the person who you found hard to love really and genuinely prayed for you and your good? Of course, if you're very petty, then now you're upset that you don't like them and they've shown themselves to be the bigger person. But you can work through that too. Would you like them to consider that there are reasons why you said the thing that you said or that you did what you did or you are how you are? Or really, what this is is kind of just treat other people how you would want them to treat you, which incidentally is also something that Jesus said. So if you want to do something awesome, that most people wouldn't do or won't do or won't even try to do. Don't just love the people that are easy to love. Love the people that are hard to love. The ones that you are so tempted to just dismiss or ignore or write off or you wouldn't quite admit this to yourself but that you kind of think aren't really up on your level at whatever level where Scripture says, here's what we need to do, is consider them as actually better than ourselves, right? If you, if you really want to do something that's worth doing something, do that. Pray for them and pray for their good, their real, genuine good. God may change them. He will very likely change you. You can ask yourself, well, is there some reason why they are how they are? You know all you ever see is just what's on the surface. You don't know what's going on beneath the surface, but you know there's a lot going on beneath the surface. You just don't know what it is. How, how good of an idea is it to make a bunch of judgments based on knowing that you don't even really know probably 80, maybe 90% of the situation? Not that good of an idea. So you just consider that. Okay, like there's, there's something here that's more than meets the eye. What, maybe... Ask yourself, how could God redeem this in my life? How can I grow and be better through this if I come at it from the perspective of what can I learn instead of just, oh, this is so frustrating. This person can be an instrument of God to grow you into a better person and better follower of Jesus. That's really kind of wonderful. And finally, you just remember that you're somebody else's person. And maybe you even know who, maybe you even know why. Think about this. Maybe you know why, and you know it's a misunderstanding on their part. Right? It's, not even, it's not even real. It's not even legitimate. They, they just got confused on something. And if they're able to do that to you, isn't it equally likely that that door swings both ways and you're in danger of doing that to somebody else? And then here's what it really all boils down to. Whatever you think of all that, here's what, it, what you can't get away from is this is just being like and following Jesus Christ who gave himself for you, humbled himself, gave up his divine privilege when we were hard to love. Scripture says when we were his enemies. And I'm so glad he did and it's, it's so much harder in the moment, I know. Like, it's easy to say these things when I'm standing here. I know it is, right? It's so much harder in the moment. But what I'm trying to be and hoping to be is not only grateful that he has done that for us, but trying and working to be grateful for the opportunities to follow in his steps. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that when we were in rebellion against you, our holy creator, as ridiculous and human as that all is, that instead of writing us off, instead of ignoring us and going the other way, you came to us at unbelievable cost that we are not even able to really comprehend, to love us for our good and when it cost you something. Father, how could, we, how could we be so grateful? What is it that we can do with that but in the power of your spirit to reflect that to the other people around us? And if you're here and, and maybe for whatever reason you've never taken that first step to connect with God through Jesus Christ, 
Today is your day. He loves you. He gave himself for you when it cost him things that we are not even able to understand in light of eternity and what it is to be God incarnating as a human being. Right where you are, right where you sit, you can just talk to God and, and pray out loud. You just talk to him and you, uh, silently he'll hear you, whatever it is. Pray, say, God, I believe. Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and be adopted as just a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. And begin to make me into the person you created me to be. And give me the life that you have for me. Of course, if you just pray a prayer like that, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's that you put your faith in Jesus. God's grace comes to you through that. You are a new spiritual creation in Jesus Christ. And the best thing you can do from here is to not try and do that by yourself. Let somebody know you can go out to the point. That's just the corner in the lobby. Let the person there know they'll take your information. We'll be able to follow up with you for some good next steps. If you're online, send us a message however you want, email or whatever, and, and we'll get that, and it'll be the same. But for those of us who, we've, we've accepted through Jesus that we were the ones who were hard to love and that Jesus, co-equal with God himself, gave himself for us. We accepted that. We received that when it was for our benefit. Will we commit right here and right now between yourself and the Spirit of God to be that extension of Jesus and to offer that to the people who are difficult for us to love? Maybe that's why God has them in your life for you to love them and to grow through that and for God to be incredibly glorified in what you thought and really felt and believed was just frustration. What if God is here to redeem that for you and in your life and in the life of, but who knows what kind of ripple effect in the community around us it may have. Father, here we commit ourselves to being as Christ-like as is superhumanly possible. We ask for your spirit's guidance and strength and courage to do and be that when it is so difficult that we would rely on you, that you would infect each one of us with your love, not our love that is thin and is self-centered and that runs out, but with your love that is powerful and that is supernatural to be your people in this world that you've placed us in for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ.